Good afternoon uh, and welcome to today's webinar. The title is Affirming Disability, Strengths-Based Portraits of Culturally Diverse Families. My name is Zach Rossetti and I'm an Associate Professor of Special Education in the Teaching and Learning Department at BU Wheelock. I am super excited to be here with all of you uh, and especially today's panelists. Um, I'd like to first thank uh, Mary, Mary Ellen Medayo um, of Wheelock Events, uh, Jonathan Bastille uh, for IT support, um, and our ASL interpreters. Um, I'd also like to take a few moments uh, to describe a couple of details um, related to the webinar. This webinar is part of BU Wheelock's Equity and Social Justice webinar series. Our aim is to provide webinars each week at this time. Uh, so please do look for remaining and upcoming webinars. This webinar uh, will be recorded. Once it is edited, we'll send you a link to the recording and we definitely invite you to share it with others. We're interested in hearing your thoughts and invite you to use the chat box to share them. If you have specific questions, please enter them in the Q&A box um, as opposed to the chat box. So we are sure to see them. Uh, the chats might fill up uh, pretty quickly uh, and, and the questions should be in the Q&A box. You can access both the chat and the Q&A boxes by hovering over those icons at the bottom of your screen. Today's webinar includes a panel of university faculty and family members of individuals with disabilities uh, who are all collaborators and co-researchers in a longitudinal qualitative research project focused on the experiences of immigrant families with children with disabilities. This project resulted in our book, Affirming Disability, Strengths-Based Portraits of Culturally Diverse Families, published by Teachers College Press uh, this past winter. Just so we have a sense uh, and, and can uh, shape our comments a little bit, we're curious and would like you to fill out the poll on the screen um, whether you have in fact read our book. And it's okay if you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we'd like folks to, to fill out the poll now if you could. Have folks had a time, a chance to fill out the poll? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, that's helpful. We do encourage you maybe to, to check out the book. Um, our schedule is as follows. Uh, the rest of the uh, panel uh, will uh, introduce themselves. Each panelist will introduce herself um, and, and her family, um, and then answer three questions. And we're going to go in order. We've structured uh, this a little bit to make sure we could get through everything. Uh, questions about the process of making the book, key lessons from the chapters, from each chapter, uh, and then updates of how people have been doing um, during these last few months during the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. 
Um, we're going to have um, some concluding thoughts uh, from Janet Sauer and me, um, and then a question and answer period. Um, if we are uh, uh, finishing up the webinar still, we'll be sure to finish by 3 p.m. for those who um, need to be uh, finished by three. Um, and we are willing to stay um, after three um, to have a Q&A for anyone who's interested and willing to do that. Um, we will, so again, we will finish by three. If we finish earlier, we'll start the Q&A. Um, but if not, we'll finish by three. And for those interested, we'll all remain on for another 10 or 15 minutes and have more of a discussion then if that's okay with, with folks. <clears throat> um, so today's presenters, as I said, include um, researchers and family members who in this project were all co-researchers uh, and collaborators. Um, before we get to the introductions, um, another uh, question for you all in the audience, uh, just to help us again shape our comments. Um, could you in the chat box, please write your role, uh, special education teacher, uh, parent, grandparent, uh, therapist, uh, and where you're from, maybe your district, or if you're out of state, out of Massachusetts, maybe your, your state. Uh, and if folks could just do that quickly in the chat box uh, so that we also can have a sense of who's here and where you're from. Oh, I see some colleagues. Hello, colleagues from BU Wheelock. <laughs> oh, BPS, Pittsburgh, thank you. Northeastern, Brandeis, Brockton Arc, Siwab. Minnesota. Okay. Ooh, that moved quickly. Excellent. Thank you all. Please keep that going so we can uh, see in the chat. I do want to make sure that we keep moving here. Um, as I said, each co-author will introduce herself and share a bit about their families. And it's now my pleasure to introduce Janet Sauer, professor of special education from Leslie uh, University, to speak a bit more about our book. Hi, everyone, and welcome. If we could go to the next slide. Zach, if you can, thank you. So I'm um, also a person who wears multiple hats, like many of you already indicated in the chat. Um, I identify as a white woman, primarily monolingual. Um, although I have learned some other languages and lived in different parts of the country in different parts of the world, um, I consider myself a monolingual uh, speaker. Um, I'm a professor of special education along with Zach, and I also am a family member. I'm one of 11 kids myself, but I have uh, two sons, one of whom was born with Down syndrome in Iowa. Um, why we wrote this book with the families was because we noticed uh, a need. Um, there were very few authentic autoethnographic stories uh, written by or with uh, people with disabilities and or their family members that we could use to teach. And so we identified this need and then we adopted an act of cultural brokering or cultural brokerage, the act of bridging, linking, or mediating between people of different backgrounds, um, and practice this in a way that we would refer to as cultural humility, um, which means we admit that we make mistakes. We will probably make some mistakes here today, um, and we forgive ourselves and accept that and learn from our mistakes and move on. So um, 
It's with great pleasure and honor that I'm here today with you and uh, share with you how we've tried to collaborate with uh, some of our partners here um, who themselves identify as people of color. Um, some are immigrants um, themselves or their families immigrated. Um, some are refugees that we worked with over the years to write the book. Um, and the co-construction model, which is described in greater detail in the book, is um, a portraiture approach in which we tried to use descriptive, authentic uh, life descriptions in order to um, provide context to the families. Um, there were certain limitations, certainly within the book, um, we want to make sure that you understand as an audience, not everyone could participate today. We had a couple of people in the book who themselves um, did not feel that they could be here because they need to use pseudonyms for protection of their identity. Um, some because of status, others because they uh, removed themselves from the project because they were concerned about um, their advocacy for their child's inclusive service. And the last thing I want to mention is just acknowledging the emotional work of the families that we've worked with um, over the years. So I, I, I want to thank them. We can move to the next slide. So the book has eight chapters and um, I'm just going to give you a brief outline of what it looks like. So the first chapter um, is all about the research, forging connections, why family engagement matters, how we know that when families are engaged, outcomes for students are improved. So one thing um, we write about in there is the importance of understanding that we don't want to pass judgments on families. Our, our work is really about understanding, developing a shared understanding so that we can all work for the benefit of the children. Um, the guests today include Susan O. Um, Chapter two, she'll be talking about her family portrait. Chapter three, um, Un and her family uh, will be dis discussing their chapter. And then um, we don't have anyone from our chapter four today, uh, the Latina mother's story. I just wanna make a mention that that was a collaborative effort between Olga Lopez from the Federation for Children with Special Needs, Maureen Lothrop Magman, who was a doctoral student, a Spanish teacher, and um, a woman who used a pseudonym named Maria. So that was a, a co-constructed chapter four. Chapter five, we have Sachin's mother here um, to talk about her story. And chapter six, um, we have uh, Kimya and her mother, um, the Iranian uh, family story. And chapter seven, we don't have anyone um, to talk about that chapter today, uh, but that is the story of a refugee mother um, from Somalia. And that was co-constructed with my colleague, Amy Gooden, who is an ESL professor here at Leslie. And the last chapter is really, um, we've written articles about this, it's in our references, but it's the idea that you take all the knowledge that you've gained from the readings and learning about the families and try to put it into your own personal action plan. So with that, I pass it back um, now to introduce Susan O, oh, who will talk about her family story. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Susan O, oh. glad to be here. I'm the Chinese Outreach Coordinator from Federation for Children with Special Needs. I'm a parent of a child with special needs and a family member of a person with intellectual disability. I have two boys. If you read my book and, and the, my chapter, the older son is eight years old and the, my younger one is six years old. And the younger one got diagnosed for language delay when he was four years old. And most recently we found out he also have ADHD. He's receiving OT and speech service through his IEP. And I'm glad to be here. And also you can see my older son drawing to describe my family and my family portrait is we have a really tiny typical family with 
two boys and parent and my and two parents. Now let me pass to on. Thank you. Hello, everybody. It's great to uh, virtually meet you all here. Thank you so much for your time being here with us today. So my name is On Bui. Um, I'm a Vietnamese immigrant and a single mom. Um, I'm Tani's mom. Um, Tani is um, 17 years old now. Um, her real name is Thu Tam Song Nguyen, and it has a very deep meaning in Vietnamese. So it uh, means that um, she is a beautiful girl, both inside and out. And uh, it also means that she has great intelligence and a good heart. So as you can see, I have a very high expectation of her when she's born, right? <laughs> so Tiny has um, two chromosome disorder. Um, one is Kabuki syndrome, and the other is uh, chromosome 15. Uh, and on top of that would be her autism. So she is an AAC communicator. AAC stands for Augmentative Alternative Communi Communication Device, meaning that she has to type on the iPad um, to communicate. Um, she's not able to use her spoken language. And she is uh, the reason for me to get up every day and do what I'm doing today. Um, so I came in the US in 2006 and Tani joined me in 2008. Um, so it's 15 years, but it's still a lot for me to really like, learn. Um, as an immigrant, I have been facing a lot of challenging navigating the system for my daughter. And throughout the journey, I'm thankfully meeting a good numbers of parents and professionals um, who are here today uh, with me. And I um, then become a country broker with Janet already mentioned earlier on to really bridge the gaps, uh, cultural and language gaps for the Vietnamese community. And after that, uh, my job is spanning using this um, cultural broker model to expand to other diverse community with the hope that they can be able to access as well. So in addition to that, I'm also a founder of the Circle for Vietnamese um, Parents, which is a grassroots nonprofit organization that provides emotional and educational support for Vietnamese speaking parents um, in Massachusetts. So the photo you see on the left here is myself and Tiny. We both wearing black shirt uh, looking into the camera. Um, thank you so much. And now I would like to pass it on to Panita to introduce herself. Thank you, On. Can you hear me? Hello, can you, can yes. you hear me? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, On. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, welcome and good afternoon. My name is Punita Aurora. Um, I have three sons, all young adults. My oldest is now nearly 28. Uh, my nearly 23-year-old son, Sachin, has a high-functioning form of autism. And uh, my youngest, 21-year-old uh, Manan, uh, has ADD. Uh, we are a multi-generational family. My parents, who live with us, um, immigrated from India, as did my husband, whom I met at the University of Minnesota. I and my three sons were born in the United States. So my parents were immigrants. They had my sisters and me. I grew up, attended college, and uh, met my husband, who was a foreign student at the time. Uh, so we've, I've been, uh, I was from the Midwest and moved to the Boston area with my family in 2011. Um, I, uh, I wear many hats, like was other mothers have already mentioned. Um, and I have a varied background with uh, you know, graduate degree in history uh, and experience uh, as a business consultant in the area of cultural competence. Um, I've also taught history uh, at the university level uh, and as adjunct instructor when we were in Indiana and uh, an entrepreneur as well. Uh, so I bring all of this experience to the way I view the intersectionality of diversity and disability. Um, I look forward to sharing more with you 
And again, thank you for attending today. With that, I will give that to the next speaker, Kimia. Thank you. Hi. Kimia wants me to go first. So my name is Shirin Sohra, Shirin Banu Sohra, and I have three children. I have a son, and I have my second daughter, uh, child, uh, Samin Banu, and then Kimia, that five years younger than Samin Banu. Uh, my educational background is in uh, psychology. I have a BA, BA degree in psychology from Cal State LA. Um, I don't know how we would like to start now. It's your turn. Oh, yes. I'm Kimia Sohra Mazi. I'm Shirin's third child. <clears throat> and I'm also the sister of Samin Banu Sohra, um, which our chapter is about. As a, I'm an Iranian American professor at the University of Redlands. I uh, did just finish my second year uh, as an assistant professor and I work with future educators and I try to um, instill the idea that that race and ability is a social construction and I, I hope that my uh, students leave and go into the classroom problematizing uh, the social construction of disability. Um, we would like to share with you uh, a poem uh, that we've written. Our, our chapter, we really hope that our story disrupts misconceptions about living with the individual with disability. And with that, we would like to read you our poem that emerged from my, our interviews together. Our Samin Banu, music and laughter are your delight. The warmth of your smile, your compassion and empathy. You are our light, our love, our teacher, a well of inspiration. My sister, you nurture my soul. Ice cream dates and family parties. Hala Samin, you are always so patient with my children. I thank God I have you and you have me. You make our lives more meaningful. I might interject and say Khale, it means auntie in Persian language. My, my eldest daughter, I am so proud of you. You are the answer to many questions about the purpose of life and what lies beyond. You have taught me to detach from this world's strives, you have become the heart of our growth. My strong child, my brave child, you teach others without words. Our beautiful Sami Bono, so full of happiness, to be loved and to have love. Oh, the, the joy, joy you bring, bring to, to our, our family. family. You soar in the realms of God because your spirit is limitless. And with that, I would like to turn, um, pass back the microphone to Zach. Thank you so much, uh, Sheeran uh, and Kimia. I was wiping my eyes a little bit. <laughs> um, and thank you to the rest of the panel for introducing uh, yourselves. Our first question uh, reflects the process of making the book. And as Janet mentioned, um, we used portraiture as our uh, research methodology uh, and purposefully chose uh, this to um, counter the traditional case studies that we see in a lot of uh, uh, special ed university courses, um, as well as the um, student files that a lot of teachers receive that just kind of focus on what's wrong. Take a deficit-oriented approach to disability, 
uh, don't really mention much about the, about the family, about the child's uh, strengths or interests or fam family makeup, family background, cultural background, uh, et cetera. And so we really uh, 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 purposefully chose to uh, expand uh, on these in this way. Um, it did take longer. Um, the co-construction approach also uh, added uh, some length. There were lots of conversations. Uh, and so we wanted to uh, ask our panelists um, about that process. Why were you interested in, in working on this? Uh, did you learn anything in the process? or think differently as a result? Uh, and what worked well or didn't work well for you? Um, and we'll go to Susan. So thank you, Zach. Actually, in the beginning, I really hesitated to say yes to the box <laughs> because it's something is not for my culture. We tend to be like reserved and per to ourselves, but in the end, I changed my mind because I hope this will be a journal for myself to capture what I did for advocating the service for both of my boys. Second, I hope it will be an example for my parents to understand the issues of navigating, navigating special education system and also the challenge they are going to face when they advocate for their rights of language access and also their kids' right of language support. And the third, I hope it will be a reflection for the professional who support the family of children with special needs to better support family needs, especially their language need. I really enjoy working with Jenna and Zach. We spend a lot of time in their classroom, their office, and even in the library to share like the self my self-reflection of understand Chinese culture because I always tell them this is what my interpretation of the Chinese culture is my own opinion. It cannot represent all Chinese how they will see the Chinese culture. And I, I almost every time when I go to their classroom, I will pull up my five slide PowerPoint and one of the slides will be showing uh, maybe a clarification for the Chinese, especially a uh, mis misconception about Mandarin and Cantonese written Chinese and also the written Chinese like simplified Chinese and traditional Chinese, what is that? So it's a lot of fun because it's still going on as every time as I have to tell everyone Mandarin Chinese is a oral Chinese and the traditional Chinese is the the written Chinese. So and I think in the end when we almost finish my chapter, I still remember one of the examples is Zanek and uh, Jenna and I decided to meet in the local library to talk about the final edition of the book, we spent at least two hours together to keep talking, reflect what we have been talking about in the book, especially about my, my final thought about navigate the early intervention system and also the special education process. And we ran over the time, even like the next parent, Jenna wants to meet and already sat next to her. I still, I still keep going on, keep going on until Jenna have to give me a signal and say, Susan, it's time for you to go. So I really, really enjoy the, working with them, especially I really thankful they curious about my culture and my own per, personal story. And I, what I hope is, for we will, I hope I will see a next book which can capture more family story. Maybe also include uh, you with special need. Maybe their own story, which really uh, a vital for the professional to understand what they have been through as a, a family or person with special need. So now I will pass to on. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Susan. Um, so just like Susan, I have been guest speakers in both Zach's and Janet classes multiple times. And uh, since then, we have collaborated on multiple different projects, including research studies. Um, so as Janet mentioned before, um, both um, Jack and Janet acknowledge that there's not enough representations of um, diverse parents in textbooks. So over the years, whenever we come and share our personal story in their classes, um, students are expected to write reflections or portrait um, to uh, express their feeling or their reflections after listening to our firsthand experience. So over time, this has a lot. So Zach and Janet decided to pursue a book with my broaden a number of educators who can read and learn from our experiences. So then the book project was born after years of building trusted relationships and meaningful collaboration. As you know, it's very emotionally draining when I have to talk about my personal story and my own experience um, navigating the special education system. But I strongly believe in the power of um, personal story or storytelling in general. So I decided to uh, own my story and retell my story with the hope that the book um, audience can have a better understanding about what our lives could be for many immigrants in the U.S. And it's sad that, I mean, if it's not me, then who? And then if it's not now, then when? So that's how our book was born. So remember that everybody's story is different. Um, no stories alike. Uh, completing this book is a long journey, but it's very rewarding for me. Is it the fruit of time, of labor, and building trusted relationship and friendship. And as you can see in the photo above, Zach and Janet attended the New Year is event for the Vietnamese um, community of disability um, that together with other Vietnamese um, families, I have um, organized it on the annual basis to have the younger generation with disability to understand, understand and also maintaining our cultural and traditional values. So what do I learn from the book? A lot a lot of reflection, a lot of conversation, a lot of emails, as you can imagine, that we have to exchange. Um, it's not easy task for me to capture the complex life and descriptively in a book. The more I wrote, the more I reflect about the journey, the more I appreciate the opportunity that my daughter has from accessing the special education and medical care um, here in the U.S. So the photos on the left here that you can see, there would be eight people um, taken in front of the red backdrop with pink cherry flowers on the left and yellow flowers on the right. Now I would like to pass it on to my fellow colleague, um, Punita, to uh, take it over. Thank you. Thank you, Owen. Uh, the process of uh, writing the book uh, was complicated for me. A year ago, uh, at this time, we were in the throes of uh, my mother's recent diagnosis of her, a second breast cancer. And uh, it, it was just a very difficult time for my family. Um, I was lucky in the sense that uh, Janet is a family friend. My children and her children uh, are friends, attended high school together. And so that relationship really helped me to focus and to do what I needed to do for uh, getting the writing done. Having said that, it was challenging to uh, speak, I mean, to write with that, uh, from the perspective of por portraiture, um, because uh, I, I mean, as a history student, I'm, my go-to form of writing is academic writing. And to see, to bring my son to life on paper uh, for a mother, uh, for me at that time, it was, it meant going through grief and just the grief of disability and, and all of those memories um, of what it meant for his education and so on. So, uh, and all of this then in turn um, really was a profound experience of the limits of language itself. To write about my own child, whom I know, 
from the beginning of his life to write about his disability uh, honestly and what it's meant for our whole family positively and otherwise was just a profound experience. Um, and uh, so my, the, the takeaways, which I will share with you a little later in our presentation, really uh, came from that experience of writing and uh, which I would have to say, you know, of course, thanks to Janet because she facilitated, uh, you know, conversations and uh, that, that just kind of helped me to be precise and really focused at a difficult time. So uh, with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Shireen and Kenya. Thank you. So I would like to actually apologize because we didn't explain the first two photos that we had. On the left, originally was a photo of my brother, my sister and I uh, with my sisters at my sister's 40th birthday party this year. <laughs> pre-COVID um, with a birthday cake. And the second photo was Sami Banu, my sister's nephews and nieces all gathered around her uh, with my father and my mother, uh, my sister-in-law and um, my brother and I. And I my husband was behind the camera taking the photo. Um, so I apologize for that. Uh, in terms of the process for our chapter, um, Initially, I, I interviewed my mother with her permission. Um, three like actual interviews. I mean, we've lived this life together with my sister, Sami Banu, who has really blessed our, our lives and in, enriched our lives. Uh, but I never had the opportunity to really write about, write about this. And I asked my mom, would you want to write? And she's like, yeah, you, you go ahead. One day, maybe <laughs> one day I'll write a whole book. Um, and I encourage her to do so, but we, she, she graciously engaged in three and three direct interviews with me. And I wrote, we, I couldn't have written the chapter without my mother and my sister. Uh, so I really attribute the chapter to both of them. Um, but really I tried to write this chapter as a dialogue between my mothers and myself telling our story, our lived experience. So phenomenology, is the idea of like approaching research to tell the lived experience of someone. So in this chapter, my mother and I worked together as a team to tell our lived experiences. Now this was really actually a quite emotional task and conversation to undertake and write about, which I hope can give uh, any of you who have the opportunity to read this book uh, a a glimpse into our lives uh, and our lived experience. And we don't claim that our lived experience represents uh, the experiences of all families uh, and individuals with disabilities, but it's just uh, one, one approach or one, one lived experience. And we're so um, honored to have the platform to tell our story. Mom, would you like to I add? must say that I'm honored that to be sitting here next to my daughter and share uh, some of the feelings with you about uh, Sam and Bonnie. <clears throat> I don't know what should I say, but I, as a mother that had been involved uh, with uh, the life of my daughter, such as Samin, um, for 40 years, uh, never things become uh, ordinary or every time, every single time I go and visit her, which is quite often, except now these four months really uh, with the COVID-19, uh, 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 it's a different story. Um, Coming in from there, I just, I pour and I cry in the car till I get home. Uh, I, I, it makes me emotional. Uh, in that process, I learned uh, a lot, you know, this 40 years. Uh, 
uh, not I say that things are getting uh, easy, but uh, I accepted that. I accepted that uh, gracefully and uh, with the help and uh, the love of Almighty God, I think I could go through days and challenges uh, with Sami. So in our chapter, we actually um, talk about how our lived, ex our culture and the hegemony of normalcy influences our ideas and perceptions of disability and how your culture influences that. So uh, you, a lot of times when we are talking, we also are trying to resist the hegemony of normalcy and what it means to be a family and have Samin Banu in our lives. Um, and uh, this picture is just one glimpse of how, uh, for my children, Samin Banu, there is their aunt. And that is their, their quote unquote normal, right? And they, they know she loves music. So we sing to her we, uh, and she smiles. And so uh, I hope, I really hope that you all get a chance to read and get a glimpse of uh, this, this tension that families face pushing back against this, the hegemony of normalcy. Yeah. It's uh, the culture, if I can bring that into the picture of uh, having a Persian culture background that I uh, grew up with, uh, it's uh, uh, kind of uh, trying to always suppress the feelings, but uh, I better uh, We'll stop. move on. <laughs> we hope you read the, the yes. books. Yeah. And with that, Zach. Thank you. Um, we have uh, two remaining questions um, focusing on some of the most important lessons or takeaways uh, from each chapter and some uh, guidance for um, those in the audience today working with uh, families. Um, and then updates about how the last few months during COVID have been, um, which also should provide some uh, context and some useful information for guidance uh, for our audience. Um, so I'd like to just get right to those and I'd like to remind our um, panelists um, to uh, uh, be as concise as possible so we can um, finish on time. Uh, just pay attention to the time as we're going, okay? Uh, thank you. And so first up is uh, Susan. Zach, we don't see the interpreter. So thank you, Zach. Zach, can you, yeah, that's, that's my story. Hi everyone. I think for my chapter is simple and straight. It's like I am not strong believer of advocate for children, for especially the ELL student with disability, their language support. Because I do think all students can be bilingual. And also we all know from all the research, the benefit of bilingualism is they can increase their cognitive benefit, academic benefit, uh, and also social emotional benefit. So I, for my chapter, right in the very first conversation I with Janet is talk about my older son when he transitioned from the early intervention to, re, to the school and I start to seek the special ed evaluation because he received early intervention with, luckily we can identify a speech pathology, even though she is not a Chinese, but she had been to China and also know a little bit Chinese. And she came to my house and work with me and help my son overcome his language disability, who is also my older son. So when I refer my older son to the special education and they just 
found out he's ineligible for the special ed service because they just say it's his but because his ELL status maybe make him a little bit speech delay, which also become one of my concerns about for my younger son. I didn't advocate for his service when he was like two or three years old because I, I will assume that is maybe the same cause like my older son. So, but when he turned four years old, it become his major issue. We have to refer him to the special education. It turned out he, he need to receive speech service through his IEP, which I think another great thing is because we have the resource and also the district have the resource, which is also a bilingual professional, support him to, to build up his language. We can see after two years working with him, his language is increased a lot and also his confidence is like also built up a lot so that he's instead of, I still remember one of the example for him when he called his brother, he like, like slow down, wait for me. And he, he will just say if without the speech service, he would just tell the brother, Chuck E. Cheese or McDonald, which that's his expression for wait for me brother so but right now we can see he, it's increased a lot because we received the bilingual professional and support his home language and also his english which i think is always like a benefit instead of taking all, away his home language and just re-emphasize his second language and also because during the process, I keep communicating with the school about my perspective and also what I value and what I hope uh, for my son. I think it just, it worked better for between me and mm, my son's teacher to understand what we need to work on to it. And the uh, very, the third one is like, you can see from my chapter, Janet how me, organize a care map, which is really helpful to help me rethink about the parent I support for my work because they don't have the language, don't have the resource and how they can access the support like me as a professional who can navigate all by myself. And the very last one is I know sometimes for professional, if you are not bilingual, you will constantly ask yourself, how can I support a ELL student and also ELL student with disability? It's just like always it's a good thing to go out, maybe even ask the parent. Parent can be your teacher to let you know their culture, their family uh, uh, history, and also how to work better with their student. I still, one of the example is one of the students from Janet's class, when we have a conversation to the end is she asked me, is it okay for me to ask my question, one of the words, how to say it in the parent language? I say, yes, please ask parent. Parent will appreciate you ask that question. That means you are willing to go out your comfort zone and you're willing to ask and also curious about their language and their culture. So that is my takeaway for my chapter. Thank you. I would like to pass to on. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, so as we all imagine that this kind of conversation, we need more than 60 minutes, right? <laughs> so I'm trying my best to really summarize um, the key lessons from, the, from my chapter um, here. Um, I have five, um, as you can see on the screen. The first one would be AAC, which being again, augmentative alternative communication um, communicator. So I could suggest that uh, when we see all uh, those who communicate with AAC, um, please don't judge them because uh, being nonverbal doesn't mean that they have nothing to say, nor not understanding what we are saying. So do spend time to build the relationship and really kind of uncover the potential from these students. So I remember very vividly the very first um, speech pathologist from my daughter asked me like, stop to speak Vietnamese once he first started public school. And it's heartbroken. It's, it's not that easy for me. 
Um, but then I have been teaching myself and training myself all about AAC, trying different devices and find her strengths and interests to really kind of facilitate the communication in a way where um, back then she loved um, animal balloons. So I taught myself to twist animal balloon so that every morning, uh, the way she communicate would be, um, she would ask me to start by um, just a red balloon but then over time, her sentences can be longer, like from red balloon to red butterfly balloon to um, I want a red butterfly balloon, uh, mom. So over time with that, she can be able to communicate much more with AAC. And depending on her interest now, um, she, I could be able to help her to expand her language in a meaningful way. The second one that I could like to send here could be the vital roles of parents because under IDEA, with is the Individual with Disability Educational Act, um, Education Act in the US, parents are equal members of the team. So I challenge us all to foster this relationship as parents, um, at uh, their children experts, because many times at the IEP meeting that um, I got the impression that the professional just saying that parents know nothing. Third could be meaningfully authentic collaboration. It takes time and it's important for us to neuter the relationship so that we all can achieve our common goals. Um, both of us, both educator and parent, we all want our children, our students to become successful, right? So it takes time to foster this and together we can do better. Four, it could be communication integration. Our children are part of the society. So regardless of their ability, some kids might need more than the other, but our task is to support them with the skill needed so that they can be able to be successful um, in life. And last of all, could be be culturally responsive to the unique needs of the diverse parents. Spend time, build a relationship to better understand the families you are working with. Spend time to learn their different cultures. Spend time to learn how that could impact their ways of communicating, their ways of um, it be engaged with the school, their way of interacting with the professional. Um, take some time to really kind of um, build trust and relationships so that you can have that relation um, and support. So as you um, can see on the photo screen, um, it's Tiny, my daughter, who communicating, um, using her device to communicate. So there's the iPad for her to access the online and then the pink iPad could be on the left, on the right, could be her communication de device and then she wear the Hello Kitty headset. And on the screen, I also would like to um, remind you um, with a quote from Maya Angelou, uh, because of the benefit of time, I would like to invite Punita to share her key lesson from her chapter. Thank you. Oh. Hello. Uh, I am. We can, can hear you. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, there are several uh, takeaways. Um, you all can see my slide here. I think what I uh, would like to just briefly say uh, is piggybacking on ideas that my colleagues have just mentioned, particularly cultural hegemony that Kimia talked about. Um, I, I think that the cultural hegemony or, or the hegemony of normalcy rather, uh, you, it, it transfers as well, I feel, uh, to this notion of cultural difference. That difference itself is not good, it's abnormal, it's something, I mean, we're, we're in this cultural moment that informs the way, it gets in the way of uh, teacher and student or teacher and family trying to serve, you know, get helping a child to learn. Um, difference is difference. Cultural difference is cultural difference. And they, these conditions or states of being can help the child to embrace all of his or her background. Language, particularly, uh, in, for our family at least, um, is or could have been uh, an access to f uh, maintaining relationships with family. In um, 
diverse linguist uh, language settings, social settings. So, you know, we we often go to India as as a family. Uh, we did when the children were little, so that they could meet their extended families, but without having access to language, because the speech therapist said that Sachin should not learn Indian languages, Hindi or Gujarati, in order to do well at school. Uh, it was as if our culture, uh, which is not past or present, it is now, it's just a matter of hopping onto a plane and going there or going and attending an Indian uh, cultural event, right? So they, it closes the door, not being able to speak those languages and communicate with elders, uh, it closes the door for relationships to uh, flourish. Um, it also closes the door to a fuller acceptance of all that one's hyphenated identity can offer. So I like that term uh, hegemony uh, because I think it captures this notion that diversity is not normal. And that experience is compounded with when, when disability is introduced to the mix. Um, and if there was one thing that I wish uh, future educators um, and, and those who work with families experiencing disability and diversity, if they're sensitive to the richness of what language and tradition can offer in the way of helping the student and the family, um, I think that there, it, it would, it just, uh, as much as it's the negative experience is compounded, I think that the positive experience could also be compounded. Um, and with that, I will, I will yield the rest of my time because I see that the clock is ticking. Thank you. Uh, with that, I would like to give it to Kimya and Shirin. So in terms of key lessons, I would like to suggest for future educators or educators, professors, and also service providers to consider relationship building. It's like key to get to know your students and their families and build trust and rapport. And this, uh, like one of the other mothers said, it takes time. And also getting to know the family's immigration experience and how that may also um, affect and their culture affect um, their understanding of disability. Dis, I, I always write disability with a slash to problematize this social construction of ability and disability. Um, and then also as educators and service providers, we need to assume competence, uh, competency of parents and family members. And just because someone doesn't speak English, it doesn't mean that they weren't, didn't come with um, the funds of knowledge that Luis Al Mole always refers to. And also consider that parents and families are maybe going through significant changes. So accustoming and learning about these changes. I think COVID has uh, brought an opportunity for us to really look at this idea of funds of knowledge that each family brings and really look at it a different night when Luis Mole talked about like home visits. Now, COVID has created this opportunity for us to really get to know our families and inter interface and interact in, on a different level with parents and families. Um, also having a culturally responsive lens. So like really familiarizing yourselves with the concept of intentionality and the family's limitations in terms of maybe the language and how intentionality and language intersect and how the words that family members use are often uh, shaped by the normative society, shaped by the medicalized model of disability, um, which, um, which oftentimes may be problematic, but really the intentionality behind the words, getting to know the family and their intention in the language they use to describe their child. Oh, or um, also learning about the cultural concept, context and cultural differences and their understanding of disability and how, how they're also their faith or religion impacts their understanding of their child uh, and this concept of disability. Um, and then also recognizing and honoring multiple forms of knowledge production. Uh, we don't only, only 
learn through reading or speaking, normative speech, right? There's so many different ways that we can express ourselves and communicate. Like my, my sister, she doesn't have normative speech, but she communicates and teaches us through her emotions and expressions. And we use mo music and poetry to c communicate with her. Uh, and, and we really feel joy as a family. Um, and I, I know she demonstrates that uh, with us. So I hope as educators, we leave behind like dichotomous, dichotomous um, thinking and binary relationships of like this idea of normal and abnormal, disabled, abled, and really think about how we can disrupt these notions that are problematic, that have been fed to us by our media and by the dominant society. And with that, Zach. As we're waiting, um, I could also say that there's uh, also in cultures, there's like, for example, the Iranian culture, deference to professionals, medicalized professionals is really like part of their culture. So getting to know the culture of individuals. And um, so not just when you look at the IEP process and um, making your goals, making realistic goals and bringing in the family and the individual into this process, if possible. Zach? So I think I can take over and talk about maybe maybe a briefly about the COVID the impact to my family because I, I think for COVID just like all the family we got impacted and we all stuck in our house for how many months it's about five months now so the good thing or the highlight for my family is like we can spend time together especially with my kids which is a luxury for working family and for my kids they also spend more time with their grandparents who is living overseas in china and they can communicate with them in chinese and pra practice their chinese which i can see a huge benefit for my parents and also for my kids and uh and also as mom i feel sometimes guilty i have not spent time with my boys and right with that i can also sit down with them and maybe even like just teach them something like they have never uh, learned before like because i'm interested to learn new language and i uh, currently i'm studying korean so i also teach them some korean so they can be multilingual but the issue with the COVID is like I said we stuck at home and now become they have missing loss of their friends lack of like peer interaction and also too much time with the screen which not also not good for their eyes and the very last uncertainty we have right now it become our constant conversation a continual conversation is what can we do about September school reopening so that's my takeaway from the COVID. I would pass to on. Yeah, thank you so much for those who stay in a little bit longer. We know as our own way that we try to time ourselves, but uh, uh, technology why and things that uh, our conversation on would take up longer. So um, definitely COVID take a toll on all of us. And if we look at the positive side, um, for me, I could be able to spend more time uh, with my daughter and really value self-care much more in a way where um, whatever natural resources that I can have um, for me, that could be more in terms of um, uh, taking care of flowers and take photos of uh, flowers. And then at the good side of this is that my daughter has more opportunity to bond with her twin cousin who are not very different in age. Um, and uh, one good thing during this time is she developed her new hobby in sleeping in the tent in the backyard. Um, so 
a lot of challenging coming with the COVID as well, um, because COVID had brought me a lot of guilt for not being able to provide her with sufficient uh, support, socially, emotionally, and educationally. Uh, and definitely, just like many others, juggling with work and education and um, family life is um, always not that easy. And um, as, uh, at the one point, I just have to give up and really let screen time to dominate, dominate her life at this time, which um, not an ideal way, but um, you know, um, it's not that easy. So I just got like to um, share, how about you, Bonita? Can you share a little bit about how COVID has been impacting your family? Sure, thank you, On. Uh, COVID has been a difficult time, but for us, it ha it's generally held more positives than negatives. Uh, my son, Sachin, attends uh, Middlesex Community College in Bedford, Massachusetts. And of course, in mid-March, um, all the classes, well, we had the shutdown and then classes started again remotely, I believe, at the start of April. Um, his younger brother also uh, moved back home from uh, Amherst, where he was going to UMass, University of Massachusetts. Um, so both kids were doing uh, college work remotely. Um, for Sachin, the good uh, outcome was that his grades really improved. Uh, he was more focused. He could, uh, he participated vigorously on in online discussions, had better access to professors. Um, there was less of the noise of daily life. Um, Sachin is a lifeguard also at a community uh, health center, a uh, fitness center. So, you know, when he leaves normally, what we used to do was uh, leave home with, I would take him to campus and he would have his uh, gym bag, he would have his lunch, He'd have his backpack, all of his stuff for the entire day for about 13 hours, everything that he would need. He'd organize a ride for himself because here in Massachusetts, he has access to, um, uh, because of his disability, um, subsidized public transportation, effectively like a taxi. He was very proud to pay for that uh, fee through his earnings and he would organize everything on his own, but um, just the noise factor of, of doing all of that, doing the homework, showing up to class and, and work and all of this, um, that just kind of disappeared and he was able to focus from home. It's really interesting that the energy that he was spending doing all of those other things of daily living that we, uh, we want our kids to do, to master, to be functional in a normal society, um, that was also providing a lot of distraction. The, the competition was people who would drive to school and then drive to work. Um, I've been reticent about letting him learn to drive or at least getting a license. He should learn to drive, but getting a driver's license for me is the, uh, I'm not willing to let go uh, for all kinds of other reasons. And that's just disappeared. Um, so what does he do with that other energy? Well, he's planning. Now he is, it was his idea to transfer to the University of Massachusetts at Lowell um, this summer. He has, he's taken it upon himself to take summer classes. He's done very well. I'm surprised that my son got 98% uh, in a summer history class, world history, uh, 1500 to the present. I can't imagine my son doing that well, but he did it. And he's taking chemistry now and doing well. So it's, um, I don't know if this is COVID, maybe it's maturity, but it's, it's come together this summer for him. Um, and with that, I'd, I'll give it to Kimya and Shirin. Thank you. Yes, uh, I must say that the COVID uh, really affected my family in a sense that we cannot really see Sami and they won't allow anybody to go and visit uh, uh, these few clients that they are in the facilities. Also, she's deprived of going to the program that uh, they program that every day she was going. And uh, over there, um, at least she could hear the music and uh, they would play with, with her. 
none of this. We were bringing her every uh, Saturday uh, home, Sunday we would bring her home, and now we are deprived of that, and she's deprived of that. So it makes it uh, really a challenge and uh, difficult uh, for us. I, we go there, and they are uh, most kind that recently they noticed because we, every week uh, we were, uh, had uh, her. Uh, they have to, they open the screen, we have to put the mask and they put the mask on her and then we just uh, uh, talk to her, take a picture and- From uh, outside. And, uh, from, a from outside, yeah, co completely from outside. And then uh, take a picture and then uh, come home. So it's been quite challenging this time. Thank you so much. Oh. Thank you. Um, all of you have shared such uh, uh, important and, and hopefully instructive or informative uh, perspectives. And, and as a uh, qualitative researcher, that's the whole point, is, is to understand how people make meaning of, of their experiences. And I think that's really important for teachers and other school professionals and providers uh, to really understand uh, families. Um, we've known families should be involved and teachers should be more culturally responsive for decades. Uh, and it still isn't happening. And I think, um, you know, again, as a qualitative researcher, I look for, for patterns and, and themes. And, and I think one of the messages that we wanted to uh, end on that kind of ties together some of these uh, concluding thoughts is the importance as providers, teachers, other educators, um, to be proactive. What we're learning from our panelists and others that uh, we know and we're speaking with and working with in the project um, uh, are that uh, in a lot of ways, we're not actualizing, we're not realizing that true collaboration, the ideal of a family school partnership. And think about, uh, you know, generally speaking, the immigrant experience in, in learning about the special ed system in the US in a language that was not your first um, is incredibly difficult work. And families are busy with that, raising their children. It should be up to us as teachers and providers to be proactive, to reach out. And I wanna end on this point. And it came up in Panita's chapter. We know we shouldn't generalize or stereotype. That's obvious. If it's happening, it needs to stop. But what I'm saying here is we need to be more proactive and go beyond that. We can use some of those generalizations to start conversations, to ask questions. As Susan mentioned, ask the family about their language, about their background, ask families about their cultural heritage, how they view disability. It may take a while, as Ann said in some of uh, her comments, building that relationship until families feel a trusted connection. But that's the work that we need to do as teachers that I don't see happening all of the time. Um, and I think that uh, is one of the keys to uh, actual, uh, actually realizing true, authentic collaboration. We did it in our project over the course of years. I know as a teacher, you have one year with your students. We fully recognize that. But every journey starts with one step. And reaching out, asking, uh, uh, and being comfortable. I know the teaching force uh, is predominantly white born in the US as I am, there's often discomfort talking about race, talking about culture, talking about where someone's from. I've been there, I still sometimes am there, um, but it's up to us to get over ourselves, to, to, to get comfortable, to do self-reflection, to challenge ourselves and just talk about these things. Um, and so now I wanna open it up. I'm gonna stop the share here. For those of you who are still here, I don't know if any of you are, I hope some of you are. Uh, I wanna open it up to our whole group again. And if, if there are any questions, you've waited, we'll wait, we'll answer them for you. If anyone wants to ask a question, 
um, in the in the chat box is fine at this point or the Q&A box. Um, and if any of our panelists want to add a thought um, in, in the absence of questions, we're here and still recording. So if anyone wants to add a concluding thought as well, please feel free. I want to say that um, Sachin, uh, I realized that, uh, I, I think it was something I heard on NPR or, or, or something that children with autism do have a, or can have a proclivity to learning language, math, music. There's something about how some forms of autism help a student to learn uh, these different skills uh, in a certain time frame. I, obviously, the, the brain is you know, growing and there, th these things are limited by time frames. But uh, I, that, I heard that at the right time and I, and I started my kids in, in tabla lessons. Tabla is a uh, percussion instrument, North Indian percussion instrument, played with both the hands. It's entirely uh, an oral tradition. Uh, so this helped Sachin in many ways. I, I got all my kids to, you know, they're a set of drums, so effectively six drums. It was very loud in my house. Sundays we would go for tabla lessons. I, I, would, I found teachers in Indianapolis, and then of course here in Boston, it's a uh, we have more in the way of, you know, uh, educational opportunities. But the point is that this is how we were able to retain uh, a connection for our three boys, where language skills uh, were cut off uh, when they were small children. We kind of picked it up again with music. Um, there is a question on, can you see the question or should I read it? If you can read, um, yeah. The question is to uh, Ms. An uh, Bui. When your daughter first arrived to the U.S., how challenging was it for you to navigate the system to get services available for your daughter? Could you highlight one or two key issues that you faced in advocating for the rights of your child to receive special ed services? Um, thank you so much for the questions. And definitely, it is very challenging navigating the whole system because it's a whole novel. Uh, it's very novel for me. I have no idea about how the special education work. And it's even more challenging when the administration or the school doesn't tell you what your rights are, um, that you can also access interpreters and materials should be translated as well. So my very first one would be at the beginning, um, I remember the very first IEP meeting after it's ending. Um, they just asked me right away to sign off on the IEP without understanding like, the whole message would be like, all right, if you don't sign the IEP, you're not going to receive, your daughter is not going to receive any services at all. So I think that a challenge for me not being aware or not knowing my rights um, at the beginning is, um, is a big barrier for many diverse parents. So. Uh, the other one would be in terms of really navigating it and really have all the understanding of how the special education work because it's very the process is very complicated and if you are not trained on that uh, you not be able to do um, any services at all and not realizing or not knowing what is out there even uh, could be hard for myself as well at the beginning so um, at the at first, I don't think that my daughter got on the services appropriately for her, um, that I have to go through multiple different trainings, get the support from other parents. Then I realized that, oh, I have so many different rights and she deserves so much more um, that over time that I know and navigate and I could be successfully having, but a lot of that could be my time and my work and really kind of do it myself. Um, nobody would share with you on that. Hope that answers your questions. I know it's like really complicated one that I can like talk more than that, but because of the time, <laughs> uh, hopefully in the book, um, if you read my chapter, you can have a little bit more of how the system um, had been in place that can be preventing from a good numbers of diverse family from accessing the appropriate services. Thank you. I would like to respond to Stephanie Cox Sowers question. She says, in what ways has your families learned from each other? What advice can you give to, bringing, to bring families together in order to support one another? In what ways can 
professionals help to negotiate family conversations. And I think this is really where, um, as an educator, or as a service provider, you really need to get to know the families and the cultures and the baggage kind of that comes maybe with their understanding of this slash ability. And like, for example, in the Persian culture, there's a lot of um, stigma and shame that initially revolves around the, under the understanding of disability. But parents end up pushing back against this. And so there is maybe res resistance or at first this idea that you don't want to connect with other parents. And so really being, be getting to know the culture, the faith, the, the, the lens through which families look, um, look at or understand initially their child. And then I also understand their narratives, narratives of pushing back. But I think the biggest takeaway is like, as a family, please consider include, including in your daily lives and activities, children from all different ability levels. Uh, I con consciously in my life with my two children make a point to have my child surrounded by my sister. So that becomes the norm. And also to invite children with all different ability levels to have play dates, to have uh, them included in birthday parties. A lot of, I, I, I look at the narratives of mothers with children with disabilities and really that sense of desire to be included and to have a community. I think we can't have uh, ed ever advancing civilization if we don't work together and we don't love one another and include each other in, in our activities and daily, daily interaction. I think that was so very well said. And I think that, you know, it could be a guiding principle for serving all children, right? Whether disability or not, uh, to accept everyone regardless of where they are and to help them along in the way that they need to, you know, to be, uh, to feel, uh, to be helped to feel uh, most part of the whole. And um, it, it's not about speaking for someone. It's about, I think, asking and asking for help to uh, be more effective toward that end. I mean, it's kind of, um, it's a principle more than it is actually uh, step by step. You know, and I think that uh, Kimia articulated that principle so beautifully. And of openness as, and acceptance. And as service providers or educators, we don't have to know everything. And this is like problematizing the idea of the expert. No, the expert is the family, is the mother, is the father, those or or the family members that's that work and with and love that child on a daily basis. So bring those bring them into the conversation. Um, it should be a conversation that uplifts all families, regardless of the color of your skin or the language you speak. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I just you. want to add into that is that this is a journey. You cannot do once and done with it. Um, it's a lifelong journey that is going to be continuing working on that. Um, one of the questions here could be how families learn from each other. Um, that's the work that I'm doing in the nonprofit that I um, founded. Um, being myself, um, not knowing the system, and I learn from other parents who are willing to share their prior experience. And from there, because of my country fellows, um, fathers and parents do not know the language. So that's why I started this with the hope that those who have walked through the experience could be able to share and learn, um, especially as you can know, if you can imagine across the lifespan of our children, things change a lot in terms of services. So younger children, um, parents who have um, older children can share their experience with parents who have younger children. And then parents who already have kids aging out of school system can be back and support and walk the parent through the whole transitioning process. See? So that when we bond together and that why the cultural brokering model is very crucial, especially for diverse community because Disability within our community is still a social stigma. It's still a very sensitive topic that we do not talk a lot about that. 
So if we can be able to connect and ident identify some community leader within that community, connect that community leader with the families you are working with and really kept rich that control and language gap over time, um, that communication and trusted relationship can be expanded and support your community more or the family that you are working with. So that one of the um, model that we have been doing and we have been supporting with the hope that um, educators and whoever working with diverse community can also look and into this model and expand that model as well. Thank you. So I, I can address one of the question is like, uh, one of the attendees asked, I'm working on a project focused on developing racial identity in early childhood with ch children identified with a disability. How much do you feel identified development is necessary or could it be more necessary in the school environment? I think actually because for my chapter is more talk about the early childhood. For, as a parent or professional, I think this is a conversation I think as professional, we should all develop as soon as the kid, when they get into like school, because that's help them recognize it can be different, different, different is great, regardless as ratio or ability, so that they, you can give the student or even family the confidence they can rely on and also to grab on to keep their journey to going on. So for my own experience is because my kid, they, they have difficulty. I, I know they sometimes ask why my friend can do this. I cannot do that. I said, because this is the great thing of this a bit is great thing of because you are different. There are things you can do it and your friend cannot do it. So I think it's good to develop that as soon as possible and help the kid to understand is their their ability and also who they are and also help them gain the self-confidence i think which also panita referred that in her chapter do others want to respond to that uh question about um uh, uh, racial identity and, and identity uh, related to disability um, for early ch childhood in particular. And then I, I think we probably should wrap up. I notice we still have a, a, num a number of people here. I'll keep, I think we're all happy to keep going. So I don't, I, someone should tell us when and if we should stop. <laughs> but we're happy to keep discussing. So much has changed probably in, in the world since, my, uh, well, 2001 is when we, before 9-11, uh, is when we began to experience um, the interaction with the school district and, uh, the, and then the experience of 9-11 itself was just such a profound moment as I, for, for all reasons that just as Americans, I think we can all, uh, say is true, but particularly for my family around this disability and diversity experience. Uh, to look, you know, we people thought that we were Iraqis, which is, there's nothing wrong to be Iraqi, but uh, to be, to look Central Asian or South Asian was just dangerous. And um, it just made the, uh, we felt so very, other uh, in just layers and layers of other um, and of course now that was 2001 and here we are 19 years later the world is a different place i think i, I you know uh, or especially around race and diversity ethnicity the immigrant experience here we are and and we're in, a, in the midst of a pandemic uh, we don't know if school is going to open or not open for many students all over the country. Um, I just wonder about alliances and working, partnering with different, you know, organizations or family groups or cultural groups um, and helping them to help their kids at home. I think that's a profound implications for the question about identity and experience of, 
um, racial difference for students. It's just a different world than it was in 2001. I, I mean, I don't even know where to begin to offer, you know, questions toward best practices, really, other than Kimia's openness that she talked about, which was, you know, it's an attitude, <laughs> an outlook on life. Can I say one last thing? As human <laughs> beings, we're intersectional beings, right? We're just, we're, we're just not our ability or you want to say disability. So just considering that you're all, all, all the beings or all the individuals in your lives are multifaceted. They have a lot of differing experiences and getting to know them um, and acknowledging um, the children's racial identities and uh, also empowering them and um, like empowering them as educators to give them like amplify their voices, teach them how to use their voice to be agents of change in our society, to, um, to really, if, and if, if not, I'm not only voice, non-normative communication, whether it be ASL, whether it be text or text to speech, or even looking like for my sister, it's just the emotion and that she can express to the world and teach us through just her being. So thinking about things just not in our normative, um, hegemonic, like, Thing, uh, like what our society expects things to be, but thinking outside of the box as educators and service providers and really lifting up each, uh, each child and uh, empowering them for who they are and what they bring to the classroom and learning environment. Thank you. And I actually uh, realized and I apologize for going over that we do need to stop. 